afternoon um, and good afternoon to our speaker today. Thank you all for joining for our February installation of the EMSL Exchange Seminar Series. I'd like to welcome and introduce our speaker for today's seminar, Dr. Olga Ovchinikova, who is joining us from Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee. Olga graduated from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville with a bachelor's and master's degree in physics. She received her PhD also from the University of Tennessee um, in chemical physics, where her research focused on developing chemical imaging approaches and was supported by a chemical physics fellowship. Following her postdoc at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, she worked as an R&D scientist and the chemical imaging team lead at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences at Oak Ridge National Lab. Her team focused on investigating relationships between physical structure and chemical functionality at the nanoscale through the unique merger of advanced scanning probe, scanning probe and ion microscopy with chemical imaging techniques rooted in innovative data processing, machine learning, and control algorithms. Currently, Olga is a senior R&D scientist at the, and the group leader of the Multimodal Data Analytics Group in the Computational Sciences and Engineering Division, where her research focuses on incorporating high-performance computing and edge computing directly into streaming data pipelines for multimodal chemical imaging and microscopy. Her work has generated multiple patents and commercial licenses to industry and has been recognized by the Fowler Marion Dissertation Award, the UT Battelle Early Career Award, ABS Rising Stars Award, UTK Research Foundation Patent Award, and the Rapid Communications and Mass Spectrometry Bannon Prize. So with that, I'll turn it over to Olga and let her introduce her topic for today's talk. Olga? Thank you very much, uh, Jade, for the introduction. And I'm really excited uh, to have the opportunity to talk with you about some of the work that we have been uh, pursuing at Oak Ridge. As Jade said, um, I was at CNMS for a long time. And so the work that you will see was actually conducted at CNMS. Um, and recently, um, as of the beginning of October, I moved over to the computational sciences side to work on the development of development of these data pipelines to enable edge computing and machine learning directly from instrumentation to be able to unravel the origins of functionality uh, through correlative multimodal imaging. So uh, what do we mean in developing workflows for multimodal imaging? Well, so if you think about what we want to do, is bring uh, different modalities of imaging together. And when you, we bring these modalities of imaging together, you're going to have different spatial temporal uh, scales that you're dealing with. You're going to have voxels of different uh, uh, sizes. And you want to be able to first be able to develop ap applications for correlation of these different data sets, as well as then start to start pulling out information in terms of physical and chemical relationships. And to do that, we want to be able to incorporate a workflow that takes advantage of our high performance computing environment. And so the, the, to do that, what we're developing is being able to do a lot of the data processing right at the microscope, so do edge computing. So the first area where you're actually incorporating uh, intervention into the data stream. And so in, in cases, it can be registration of the data. In some cases, it can be data reduction and compression. In some, it can be automatic segmentation. And then feeding that data directly back to the OLCF, our HPC computing facilities, to do further processing and also compare with modeling if you want to be able to take your data and compare it and run MD or DFT simulations. And so to be able to generate basically uh, new knowledge that would then kind of start building you a picture of the correlation of the structure function relationship and materials. Now, some of the materials that we've really been focusing on in particular are functional materials. And one, material, and one class of materials that I've worked uh, a lot in the past, let's say, six years with is ferroelectric materials. And uh, of course, uh, ferroelectric materials are very um, ubiquitous in technologies we use today, from uh, data storage uh, to microactuators to for use in second harmonic generation. And the, however, the macroscale behavior of these ferroelectric materials is really determined by their nanoscale pair characteristic in terms of their uh, switching of their domains and their polarization screening phenomena. And that requires a comprehensive investigation of these materials at the nanoscale. One of the premier approaches, and it's been developed over the past 20 years for studying 
uh, materials at the nanoscale in terms of the functional material response is atomic force microscopy. Um, for those of you who are most probably familiar, uh, AFM uses a sharp pointed cantilever with a tip that allows you to basically probe and sense material physical properties. Since you're physically probing the surface, you can get mechanical properties. You can also bias the, your sample or the tip and get electrical properties. And you can get even things like magnetic properties all using at the nanometer scale. However, um, you know, when you're looking at ferroelectric materials and you're using the AFM, you in particular, you can start using something, a technique that's called piezo response force microscopy, which basically gives you information about the electric and mechanical response of the material. And so if you use PFM on a ferroelectric, and this is a layered ferroelectric material, this is a copper indium thallus uh, phosphate, it's a van der Waals crystal, and it's being, it's being investigated for uh, quantum materials applications. And you can see, you can do the AFM topography, you have these different layered flakes. However, when you do PFM, it now allows you to see from the PFM amplitude, what you see is you start seeing the domain walls, and from the PFM phase, you have the different domains up and down polarization. You can also use um, AFM in terms of when you're looking at uh, ferroelectric materials. You can use not only PFM for imaging, but like I said, you can bias the AFM tip, and now you can switch the different polarization of the domains. You can also measure the hysteresis loop. You can do a switching cis spectroscopy associated with the switching of the domains, and you can also even use the AFM tip to do nanolithography into write-in domains. And so here's an example of uh, based of writing in your own domains and then switching them. This is a polarization um, hysteresis you can measure directly from the surface. And when you start using PFM to investigate materials, what you start, you know, you should expect a strictly physical phenomena, right? So switching of the ferroelectric domains, However, uh, some of the work that was done at Oak Ridge by Anton Eovlev and Sergey Kalinin is they started looking at switching of a pretty traditional ferroelectrum, lithium niobate here, um, under different at, uh, conditions, atmospheric conditions. So in terms of switching, uh, changing the humidity during which you're switching the domains. And so as you can see, when you're switching the domains with 0% humidity, they're, they're pretty regular domains here that you're applying. However, as you're starting to uh, change the humidity from zero of all the way up to 60, you start having very irregular patterns, not regular. And you can see, you can even start making asymmetric domain shapes. And so what this leads you to sort of speculate is that there's more to ferroelectric switching than just the physical mechanism of switching of the polarization. There's actually a chemical phenomena taking place at the surface in terms of how it's affecting the switching and the uh, screening of the domains. However, AFM is chemically blind, and so it doesn't allow you to provide information what's actually happening at the surface chemically when you're studying these domain structures. And it gives you no information about local chemical gradients, as well as no information about crystallographic orientation of the sample, which is important for um, understanding ferroelectric behavior. And when we started to explore uh, what are some of the chemical effects phenomena in ferroelectrics, what we found is it's much more complicated than we actually thought of before. So if we take it, another ferroelectric material, this is bismuth ferrite, BFO, and we try to switch it locally, and you can see here, and so this is basically, we applied enough bias to do uh, some surface modification. We did um, basically irreversible switching. What we found is that we actually start getting the movement of base species throughout the, the thin films. But what's more interesting is it's not only do we have the motion of the base ions in, in the ferroelectric when we're applying the bias, but we also have changes in surface chemistries that take place from uh, elements that they didn't even know were there. So for instance, in this case, we actually saw chlorine over here penetrating into the BFO and the chlorine was on the surface basically from the processing of the film. So when you're switching these materials and some of the behaviors you see are actually being caused by the local chemistry of the surface. The other thing that we found is when you're probing your materials using SPM, you're using an AFM probe. And if anybody's ever used an AFM probe, then you know that they're stored and come to you shipped in a gel pack 
Well, this gel pack is made of PDMS. And what happens is you actually have deposition of siloxanes onto your surface when you're doing imaging with the SPM. So you actually are now measuring a convolution of your signal from in terms of the material, the material on the surface and something that you're depositing uh, onto the surface from the AFM tip. And so your effects that you might be measuring locally when you're studying these materials is actually a convolution of many chemical effects and physical effects. And so here's another uh, kind of kind of an example of what we're talking about. So if you take a PZT film that, and this is basically a cross section of TEM, you, what you see is that you have this pristine PZT film and then on top of it, you have this basically amorphous material that has built up on top of it. And if you can see the film here is the fair, this is the hysteresis loop that you measure on it. However, you can, what you can do is you can, we can then actually remove using an ion beam, we can sputter off that amorphous layer and remove part of the PZT film. We can actually improve on the fair electric property. And this is 1% sputtering and this is 50% sputtering. So now we're removing the film and, we're, uh, and thinning the PZT. And so to be able to understand some of the fundamental mechanisms um, in terms of driving these fair electric materials, and being able to improve on their performance for things such like memristors, we really need to do multimodal imaging where we both measure the functional physical response of the material as well as the local chemical environment. And so kind of the takeaway message is uh, chemistry actually plays a critical role in defining the functionality that we're measuring in a lot of our techniques. So how do we go about measuring both the chemistry and the physical response of the material together. And so we worked with Iontoff and on getting one of their first uh, beta test instruments, which combines an AFM inside the same chamber of a time of flight secondary ion mass spectrometer. And so you basically have the ability to now perform chemical analysis uh, using TOF SIMS. And for those, I know there's a lot of TOF SIMS experts in the room, but for those who may not be, is you know, top sims you use a focus ion beam that generates primary ions onto the surface. You can now focus this beam down using electrostatic lenses. You can create a, a reaction ion cascade that creates your secondary ions, which you can extract down, down the um, uh, time of flight tube to detect. And since you're doing this on a point by point basis, in each point you now have a spectra of all the ions removed. You can also move the ion beam across the surface and generate an image of each individual peak, as well as you can now, since the ion beam is destructive, you can remove material using either this ion beam or in our case, we actually have several different uh, sputtering ion sources and do a depth profile. And since it's in the same chamber, we can now do correlated imaging with the AFM and do the same type of functional response as PFM or mechanical measurements on the same sample on the same area. Now, so what does that give you? So now when we're studying our fair electric behavior, we can do the same type of um, physical characterization. So we can do, uh, this is a PZT sample, sort of a very standard fair electric that has been well studied. And what we can do is we can now use an oxygen um, sputter source that we have in the top sims to actually remove that top layer of material that I showed you that kind of builds up on the PZT, that amorphous layer, to have a, a true surface state, right? So now when we're going to switch the material, we're not actually having a convolution of what's on the surface and the actual material, but actually measuring the material properties as a function of fair, of fair electric switching. And what we can do is we can use the AF tip, FEM tip in the same way that I showed earlier, we can do uh, basically draw in domains. So we, we can go in and draw in a minus four domain, um, then a plus four domain, then a minus four domain. So it basically creates the stack structure when you draw in first this one big box of this minus four, then you go inside, you draw another plus four box, then you go in minus four box. And so you can see the domain walls and the PFM amplitude, and you can see in the phase the domains. is we can actually then go to that same area and look at the what it, what is the chemical changes associated with this behavior. And as you can see, 
we have a fully reversible switching that's taken place, right? There's no surface damage that's happened from the switching. We can go from positive to negative voltage and have complete reversibility in the fair electric behavior. Now, if we do um, this top SIMS analysis on it, you can see the full scan mass spectra where we're, you can see all the base peaks, you can see the titanium, zirconium, and the lead. And because we have an AFM inside, instead of having a relative sputter yields for our elements, we can actually do depth calibration. And we can measure the exact depth of the changes in the chemical species of the area that we have sampled. And so now over here, you can see the XZ cross section of that same uh, switched PZT. And what you see is you actually, when you're doing fully reversible switching, you actually have a motion of the base elements moving under the bias of the switching. And here you can see the lead, the titanium, titanium oxide at a depth of one nanometer, at a depth of 1.7 nanometers. And then as you go to 2.4, you actually have an inverted contrast of the lead. And we believe this is due to basically screening effects that are happening at the surface. And this has been predicted for lead, but never actually visualized um, chemically. And so you can see the fully um, reversible switching is actually driving uh, chemical segregation in these materials and all the way down to um, chemical changes down to three nanometers. And when you do a percent change in the material, we can calculate the percent change of the material between the lead and the, and the, tit and the titanium here to be around a couple of percent. And so even in kind of the takeaway, you know, when you're thinking that you're doing something that's only a physically physical in nature, you actually might be having chemical changes associated with it. And so uh, this kind of started got us thinking about, well, you know, in ferroelectric materials, as you apply them to things like memristors, there's a really a well known phenomenon known as ferroelectric fatigue. So basically ferroelectric fatigue is when you take the material and you start switching it uh, millions of times it starts to take higher and higher voltage to switch it. And there's been a lot of uh, proposed theories as to how, uh, why this mechanism happens. And one of the things, uh, given this, the results that we saw in terms of the motion of the base elements, this started us thinking is maybe there is a chemical phenomena associated with switching of the material. Uh, however, to be able to switch something uh, basically, you want to be able to apply millions of cycles to be able to study that. And it, that is very difficult on a single thin film. However, uh, working with some collaborators, they were able to make for us a basically local small nanocapacitor. So this is a PZT, but on top of it, you have basically a capacitor cap. And so you can see instead of a perfectly thin surface, you have these 200 nanometer nanocapacitors. And so now we can do the same thing. We can do switching, we could do these lithography, but instead of having a perfectly straight line like we had before, now we're switching individual capacitors um, when we're doing the uh, fair electric switching. And so now what we can do is instead of doing a DC switching when we switch at once, we can basically apply an AC bias and do tens, hundreds, and thousands and millions of uh, switching on individual nanocapacitors. And basically what we're showing here is that we still have intact fully switchable capacitors after um, even a million cycles. And so we can now do the same thing here and go and look at our areas in terms of switching and then do a TOFSIMS uh, chemical analysis on the capacitors. And what we see is, and so these capacitors have a, a copper electrode on top, is after, as we go up in terms of a number of switching, we actually see have copper penetrating from the electrode into the PZT film. And so you can see that right here, here's the copper electrode and you can see it penetrating into the PZT film. And so that got us sort of thinking is, okay, well, is that really even possible? Can you have copper penetrating and the materials still be a switchable fair electric? And so you can see you kind of right here and it's kind of, it's pretty linear in terms of cycles, in terms of how much uh, copper we're pushing into the, into the film and how deep it's going. And so what we did is uh, we basically worked with some of our uh, theorists to do some DFT ab initio calculations and to basically take uh, the, one of the leads out of the B site and replace it with a copper. So you can see that right here and calculate based on the um, 
doping of copper to see what happens in terms of the material and being ferroelectric. And then on top of it, what we did is we did a switching spectroscopy where we measured the ferroelectric loop opening as a function of cycles. And you can see that your loop opening actually decreases as a cycle, so you have less switchability, so this fatigue notion. And what we found is that correlates very nicely with our ab initio calculations that we found that initially we actually, as you replace the copper, the material is still ferroelectric. Of course, if you have a very high dosage, you go to the metallic. And what we believe is happening as we're putting in the copper into the lattice, we're actually basically creating frozen domains within the PZT that doesn't allow them to switch. And so you have less switchability. So we were able to basically show that potentially there's, when, as you're designing uh, these devices, you have to be very cognizant of the type of materials you use. And copper is a very common electrode because it's very cheap but copper can actually penetrate into your PZT device lattice. And now you can start having this basically copper intercalating into the structure, causing uh, ferroelectric fatigue and shift, in the, and shift in polarization. So another uh, material that of course has gotten a lot of press and for good reason, is uh, hybrid organic, inorganic perovskites, uh, and they have really taken off in the past five years because of their remarkable uh, photovoltaic um, conversion efficiency. So if you look over here, uh, MHPs have been able to achieve 23.3% efficiency in just about five years, and this has taken traditional silicon solar cells over 40 years to achieve. On top of it, there the processing that you can do. You cannot. You don't have to have them on a rigid substrate, as you can see here. They, uh, you can deposit them on flexible substrates, and we've done that. And this is, of course, for wearable devices and electronics. Um, however, there is still a lot to be understood in terms of uh, since you're taking this perovskite structure as we had before in the ferroelectric, but now instead you're having this organic cation molecule. Um, that is sitting in the center, you have a lot of interesting potential behaviors in the interaction of different properties. So because you have a perovskite uh, structure, um, they, these materials have been uh, proposed to be ferroelectric in nature, and so you have this uh, a dipole. Because you have this organic molecule, they've also been proposed to be ferroelastic in nature. But because you have a small organic molecule, there also have been talk about ion migration, and all of these phenomena have been talked about contributing uh, to the functionality of the material, both in positive and uh, negative ways in terms of performance. And of course, you know, again, as we're talking about these materials, the uh, especially for uh, HOIPs, there's a lot of nanoscale structure that really determines the functionality of these materials. So anywhere from grain structure and grain boundaries to domain structure, to ion migration. And so a lot of work has been done in the area of using scanning probe microscopy, again, AFM, to probe all of these phenomena, because I showed you we can, we can do PFM to measure the ferroelectric response. We can also PFM to measure, sorry, ferroelectric here. We can also use PFM to measure the ferroelastic response. And we can bias the tip and uh, measure local ion migration. And what you find is when you're measuring these things in a, uh, using scanning probe microscopy, they're actually intertwined, right? So it's very hard to separate out the different measurement modalities, right? How to separate out the potential from the ferroelectric response from the ferroelastic response. And this is where we started applying multimodal imaging to the system to start separating out the behaviors. And so we use scanning probe microscopy to be uh, to study the, this is a polycrystalline uh, thin film of a methyl ammonium lead iodide. And what we did is we basically, if you do SPM, you can you can see this kind of morphology. And then we can overlay and you look at the surface potential of the system and you can see that we actually have enhancement around the, the grain boundaries. And some people say, oh, look, okay, of course, KPFM, when you're, measurement, when you're doing the measurement, you're going to have a stronger response in a valley than on a hill. And this is an artifact. 
But to avoid that, what we did is we did actually band excitation KPFM, which allows us to always be on resonance when we're doing that, allows us to take uh, to get rid of this of the artifact in terms of that you usually see with KPFM. And so what we found is that if we take an unpassivated uh, uh, MAPI film, and then we can see we have this enhancement around the grain boundaries. However, if we put PCBM um, in terms of the passivation layer, we actually have a flip between the grain boundaries and the grains. And so you now have more activity on the grains in terms of surface potential versus in the grain boundaries. And that started us kind of thinking along the lines in terms of, well, can we enhance or suppress ion migration in these materials um, at the grains and the grain boundaries without uh, just the passivation layer? And so we started working with a mixed uh, halide perovskite. So this is just the basically the standard uh, lead iodide. And you can see we can have the surface charge, the capacitance, and the ion motion. And then if we do a mixed halide where we have both chlorine and iodine, we actually have a very different response where we actually have a much stronger response at the grain boundaries versus in the grains and some grains as well. And then we can also, in terms of just measuring the surface charge and capacitance, we can actually measure the hysteresis and get the ion motion. You can see that there's a pretty strong uh, dependence in terms of uh, in terms of ion motion between the grain boundaries and the grains. And so, given that that the only thing that we're changing is the chemical co uh, composition, we we are pretty confident that we thought that chemistry was responsible for this ion migration. And what we did is we did uh, top sims on these analysis, and what we found is that in this mixed halide perovskite, the chlorine actually ended up segregating to the grain boundaries. And you can see that here um, instead of in the grains. And using working with our local theorists, we were able to uh, use ab initio MD and DFT simulations to, uh, to calculate the local um, ion migration time for both chlorine and iodine. And what we found of is chlorine it's much more likely to migrate in the grain boundaries because the iodine is going to be coordinated much more to the perovskite and it's much bigger. And so iodine, so chlorine, which is smaller and less coordinated, is going to be much more free to sit in the grain boundaries and migrate um, under applied bias. So given that we know that these materials exhibit strong ion migration kind of in the grain and grain boundary structure. And I showed before with our ferroelectric work that there is a chemical nature that can be associated with ferroelectric switching. We started wondering is could there be a chemical nature associated with some of the phenomena that has been investigated or proposed in terms of the material and being ferroelectric and ferroelastic. And of course it's a still quite a hotly debated topic. And we wanted to see what, from our standpoint, you know, how can we probe this and understand this functionality better? And what could that chemistry be that's driving these material properties? And so uh, working again with a polycrystalline thin films, you know, we could create these um, beautiful uh, film structures and we had uh, quite good photovoltaic efficiency because, you know, you can make a lot of materials, but then if they don't actually behave like they would in a device, you're not really comparing apples to apples. And so our, our devices are not at 20%, but they're sort of in the high teens, 17 to 18% conversion efficiency. And you can see that we're creating these, this is an SEM image, we can create these, these are these grains, but then inside the grains, you can now see this striped patterns here that look very similar to what you would expect from a fair electric domain walls and domains. And so we wanted to do kind of a comprehensive investigation to kind of start linking the local uh, functionality of the materials with chemical nature. And so, as I mentioned earlier, when you're trying to use SPM uh, to probe these uh, functionalities using just a regular uh, cantilever-based deflection, you're actually measuring multiple interactions at the same time. You're, when you're doing electromechanical uh, characterization with the SPM, you're not only measuring the true deflection because you're measuring on a four quadrant de detector, you're actually taking the uh, angle of the, cant of the whole cantilever deflection. And so that can be dependent on multiple things, not just the electromechanical response, but also on 
uh, for instance, surface charge and capacitive coupling of the cantilever with the material. And so in collaboration with Oxford Instruments, uh, we have been working uh, with them on developing their interferometric beam detection approach for AFM, which instead of using a centered optical beam, you now have an interferometer detection. And what you can do is you can place your interferometer uh, uh, spot right here where B is labeled, which is right above where the tip is on the surface. So all you're measuring is really the, the, the electromechanical response of the, of the tip motion, and you're now getting it in picometers, right? So you're actually measuring that directly in, instead of getting an angular displacement that you're converting to a, a displacement in terms of nanometers. And what we found is that if we measure it at the Basically, if we take this material here and we, uh, this is the topography, and we put the cantilever um, and we put the interferometer beam right above the tip, we actually get no domain structure. However, if we move the uh, interferometer beam to these positions A and C off of the magic, so now we're actually not only we're measuring more of the cantilever motion, we start getting these beautiful ferroelectric domains as we saw in the SEM. Now, given the thermal noise on this cantilever, and since we measured the D33 uh, directly, our, our noise floor is we can't detect any ferroelectric uh, response below one picometer for, for volts, so electromechanical. And so this made us, th this basically got us thinking, okay, one picometer per volt is pretty low, but you're getting all these domain structures that look very much like you would in regular ferroelectric Material. And could this be due to more of a chemical nature in terms of interaction on the surface and surface potential that is driving the measurement of, the, um, of these? And so working again um, with Oxford Instruments and the IDS, what we found is that if we do a topography of these materials and then we measure the standard optical beam deflection, and here is your amplitude, the domain walls, and this is your phase, and then we can, that correlates directly uh, with the frequency response uh, that's measured uh, using their DART system. And what you can see in, in, in general in AFM is your frequency response and shift in frequency is due to changes in mechanical properties of, the, of these materials. And so you can see that the um, PFM response is directly correlated to the frequency response. However, if you do um, IDF, we get no fair electric switching. So um, this kind of started us down the road that thinking that, okay, these materials might not be fair electric, but they might be fair elastic. And so there might be a mechanical, uh, chemical mechanical uh, correlation between the, the structures. And, you know, where, how can you possibly have this kind of, you know, fake response? Well, it's pretty, it's actually, if you've done um, AF, um, AFM or PFM a lot, you know that you can actually take a phase separated polymer. This is PMMA PCL. And if you do PFM because of the capacitance coupling between the two materials, you actually get something that looks like, you know, 180 degree um, phase switching on these materials. But then that's actually directly coupled with your mechanical response. And in other cases, if you look at these same type of polymers, um, this is actually work that we did where we looked at the phase segregation of poly 2 vinyl pyridine and polystyrene. When you have this kind of link in mechanical properties between the two systems, there actually can be a very strong chemical segregation associated with it as well. And this is a mass spectrometry image of uh, 2 vinyl pyridine correlated to the stiffness. And so the question is is the cantilever motion of what we're measuring? Um, basically an effect of a mechanical chemical contribution instead of an actual tip motion and fair electric response and could chemistry be driving uh, what we're actually seeing in these materials and what we did is to try to study the local chemistry we need to get a probe small enough to capture the in local and if you look back at the size of these 